Our Future on Mars, with James Burke, Executive Director of the Mars Society. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Mann. This week, we're going to look at our shared future living on the surface of the red planet. Later in the show, we're going to be talking with James Burke, Executive Director of the Mars Society. Now, science fiction has fueled the human quest to live on Mars for generations. From the technically adept, if illness-prone aliens of H.G. Wells, The War of the Worlds, onward to Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles, and through Red Mars from Kim Stanley Robinson and beyond. Oh, they told me it's just a cold. Don't worry about it. For God, you're just 412 years old. Writers have long envisioned a future where humans have the technology to trend, terraform the red planet, making it hospitable for life. The idea of settling our planetary neighbor is so common in science fiction that it's nearly impossible to separate the genre from the idea of living on Mars. Now, in the early days of science fiction, tales of life on the red planet were often filled with adventure and danger, as humans battled past aliens and harsh environments. But, as our understanding of Mars has grown, so too has our vision of what living on the red planet might be like. These fantastic tales filtered through the light of modern science, strip away the hostile aliens, leaving us with just the adventure, danger, and harsh environments. The conditions aren't bad once you get used yeah. to it. Just jump in. Today's writers often envision thriving Martian communities complete with terraformed landscapes, sustainable habitats, and even robust interplanetary trade and commerce. Nations, corporations, and non-governmental organizations are now investing billions of dollars in developing the technology to get humans to Mars and stay there. Many of these groups, including NASA, have plans to establish a sustainable human presence on the Red Planet in the coming decades. As uh, science fiction also popularizes the idea of living on Mars, making it more of a mainstream concept. Thanks in part to sci-fi, people now think of Mars not as a distant and uninhabitable rock, but as a world for potential with human life and exploration. This vision fuels public support for space exploration, pushing us toward the stars. Next up on the Cosmic Companion, we talk with one of the people helping to make the red planet our next home for humanity. James Burke, Executive Director of the Mars Society. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by James Berg. He is Executive Director of the Mars Society, and we're going to talk about the human, our human future on the Red Planet. Welcome to the show, James. It's a pleasure to be with you, James. Thank you. So can you give us just a brief idea of what is the Mars Society for those who may not know, and what is it that you hope to accomplish? 
Yes, we are a worldwide nonprofit organization. We um, advocate for a human mission to Mars. We operate a series of research stations around the world, uh, including one in Utah called the Mars Desert Research Station, where crews will come and practice living and working on Mars. And we've uh, operated those stations for about 20 years. We also have other education programs, such as our recent high school engineering competition that we did last year. And we're looking to scale up this coming year, yeah. um, as well as many other activities. We have chapters around the world and we have an ambassador program where we have people go out and talk to their local communities about humans to Mars and settling Mars. Mm -hmm. That's great. And so I'm intrigued by your research stations. How do they, what are you doing there and how would it compare to, let's say the biosphere too? Yeah, that's a great question. And I actually got to visit Biosphere 2 last year uh, because we had our conference nearby at Arizona State University. So our research stations are designed to uh, research the human factors challenges of living and working on Mars. We at the, at the Utah site, we've had over 1,500 crew members over the last 20 years. Um, so each one of those crew members is usually on a crew of six to eight people. They, mm -hmm. they stay at the station for about two weeks. All right. They go to simulation and they basically pretend they're on Mars. They are not allowed to go outside unless they put on a spacesuit. And we have many different research facilities there, such as a greenhouse and a science lab and an engineering work center. And so um, often crews will bring research, you know, a lot of our crews are from universities or professional crews as well. They'll bring their research and they'll do biological, geological experiments. They'll collect samples. They'll do things like uh, med uh, medical drills, wilderness medicine type of things. Mm -hmm. um, it's located, the site in Utah and the site we have in the Arctic in Canada are both located in places that are called Mars analogs which mm -hmm. is a place on Earth that's like Mars geologically. So they're very interesting to study for Mars scientists. And we use those stations to practice what it's going to be like, all the operational challenges and psychological challenges of working together and living together on Mars. Yeah, that's so cool. So, you know, if, you, if there were people actually living on Mars, there would be about a 15, often be a 15, 20 minute gap in, in trying to communicate with them. You send a question from Earth, takes 15 minutes, let's say, get to Mars, they respond 15 minutes back. Are you building that communication time delay into, we into do. these projects? We do. The crews definitely feel like they're cut off and isolated. And generally, what the way we would the way you would handle that on Mars is you'll use a lot of email. Right. You'll use a lot of good old-fashioned writing someone a letter about what you need and, and what you want and um, short video messages you send and then you get back one maybe an hour later. So it's a lot more like email than like real time Zoom, you know, mm -hmm. communications. But yeah, there is a delay and sometimes the Earth and Mars are on opposite sides of the sun. So unless you have a relay satellite somewhere, you're not gonna be able to talk to Earth. Right, right, right. It's amazing. So um, how close are we now to having the technology let's say, to put humans on Mars? I think we're very close. Matter of fact, um, this has been something we could have been doing already uh, with modern day technology. Honestly, with the technology we used to go to the moon, we could have been doing this. But uh, right now, it's all about really the hardware you need to mm -hmm. um, launch to Mars and land on Mars. And th the folks that are out front right now are SpaceX with their Starship project. So a lot of us just keep a close eye on how that's going. Um, but there was also news this week that NASA is also going to invest in nuclear thermal propulsion with DARPA. And so that's also another great communication or um, propulsion mode, transportation mode to go to Mars that would shorten the trip uh, mm -hmm. from Earth to Mars from you know six to nine months to maybe three months. So that's very helpful. But yeah, it's it's all it's a lot about just kind of you know, there's a lot going on and just keeping track of, of all the different options out there. Hmm. And so I'm just curious, like, you know, if you're going to go to Mars, you're going to have two problems. First, you need 
a whole lot of fuel and mass to leave the Earth, leave the gravitational pull of the Earth. And then once you get to Mars, you have to turn around or something and then have a whole lot of fuel and mass going into um, into slowing down to be captured by Mars. So how, what do you see are the most plausible ways of, of having a reasonable... Uh, a ma- reasonable size and cost to, an air- to a spacecraft. Well, I would refer you to the Mars Direct plan that Robert Zubrin developed in the 90s. Um, that's still a great base mission. Um, and the great thing about that plan is you're utilizing the resources on Mars to get you the fuel for your return trip. So that means you have to bring less mass with you overall on the mission. Mm-hmm. Um, but in general, what you're talking about is, you know, a, a, the transportation mode from Earth to Mars using conventional propulsion would be like a three to six month trip. Mm-hmm. Um, there's different there's different options you have for trajectories to Mars, transfers to Mars orbit. Right. From, right. Um, but in general, you're going to be captured into, air, you know, you're going to use aero capture and you're going to use aero braking to slow down your spacecraft right. by dipping it into the atmosphere of Mars, which is what all the rovers and landers have, have done. Um, it's just on a larger scale because you're talking about a human crew. So it's a factor of 10, roughly, in some cases, um, at a minimum, from what mm-hmm. we've launched before. So we the landing system still needs to sort of be developed and engineered, tested for a human class lander, like a 10 to 15 ton metric ton lander. Um, but nice. other than that, I think we understand pretty well what we need for the technology. And as far as the surface operations, again, it's just a matter of developing the hardware we're going to use. A lot of the mission plans have you landing landing in your spacecraft and your habitat. You know, the spacecraft that came with you from Earth is your habitat on, on the ground. But there's other concepts where you land the base separately and maybe construct it out of local materials using 3D printing. And other right. techn- you know, there's a lot of concepts around that. But I think for a first landing, something like the Mars Direct plan um, or, you know, what's SpaceX is, is essentially designing as the Starship, and the Starship itself would land on Mars, and you basically have a large um, payload that you could land along with that. So there's, you know, there's lots of different options with today's technology to do this. Cool. All right. So we've talked a bit here about the how of going to Mars. Give us a look at, if you would, at the why. What what is, what is the what is our future on Mars like? Yeah, for me, there's a lot of reasons why you should have a human Mars program. The number one reason, though, is you can search for life on Mars. And if we found life on Mars, it would be a tr- tremendous scientific breakthrough that would lead to all sorts of discoveries. And Mars is the best place to look for life in the solar system. I mean, Europa and Enceladus are also great candidates. Mm -hmm. Uh, But Mars is something that we can reach and we can send human explorers, which I also think is important. If you're serious about searching for life, you should send humans to search for life. Um, It's a lot more. We've we've discovered with our analog bases that it's a lot more effective for human explorers to find things than robots. You know, we on one of our first crews out in Utah, we found a major dinosaur dig site and um, it was in a place where you couldn't have sent a rover. And even and if, you, if you did send a rover there, it never would have found it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that for us, that was just a great example of why human explorers are the most effective. Now, there's other reasons to go to Mars. I mean, if you believe that we're going to settle the solar system someday, you know, Mars is a great place to send people because it's got natural gravity and it's got all the resources you would need not only to support human life, in, in terms of water and oxygen, food, but also like making things like electronics and plastics. Hmm. You know, you can, there's resources like that on Mars that you don't have on the moon, for example. Um, so for all those reasons, as well as just inspiring people, I mean, a, a human Mars landing would be a watershed moment in history. Yeah, it yeah. would unite the planet. It would tell every young kid around the world that if you study your math and science, you can go pioneer another planet. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's another huge reason for me is to inspire people to enter science careers. Fantastic. And um, what are your thoughts, you know, as as you're talking about, you know, starting out to 
live on different worlds and uh, outposts in this in the solar system what are the advantages to going to mars first as opposed to using the moon as a stepping stone well i definitely think we should go to the moon and use it to test our techniques and our hardware for mars because the moon's only three days away mm -hmm. um now there's 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 sort of the right and wrong way to go back to the moon in my opinion and in others opinions um, what NASA is doing now is one way to do it, building the lunar gateway and having, you know, many multiple launches required to land one crew is the path they're on. Um, I don't think that's the most effective moon program. Uh, I'd rather see us have a human Mars program and then work backwards of testing the hardware we're going to use for Mars on the moon. Um, but, uh, the lunar, a lunar test bed is useful for a lot of, a lot of reasons and also just the human factors of explore of landing on the moon and operating on the moon we don't have a lot of experience with that we just have the apollo missions and so if we're going to go all the way to mars and have a crew be there for a year on the surface um we probably should practice on the moon first okay and so what do you see as a realistic timeline for putting humans on the face of the red planet I, I do believe that SpaceX's Starship project, if it continues on its current course, will be the way that we reach Mars first. And um, it's looking like it'll be around 10 years from now. Um, so about 2033 or so. Um, I wouldn't sleep on NASA, though, because the nuclear thermal propulsion announcement they just made this week is talking about a 2027 test flight of that system. And if that's up and running, it wouldn't be that hard to plan a human mission around that hardware stack uh, the latter part of this decade. Hmm. What is it? What is your biggest hope for humanity if we manage to get to Mars? What do you hope we as a species get out of get out of it? I hope it is something that elevates our consciousness overall. It helps us rise above our petty politics. And, and work together as one humanity. Just like when people go to space, they experience the overview effect mm -hmm. and they see the planet differently and they see their, their, their own role and maybe their, their, you know, their culture's role differently and see themselves more as one, one world and one humanity. I hope that by going to Mars, that also helps us unify everyone back on Earth. Wonderful. And so finally, if people are interested in learning more about the Mars Society, where can they get some more information on you folks and your mission? Yeah, they can start on our website, which is marssociety.org. They can click through there and get information on all of the projects we work on, such as our research stations. We also have an online encyclopedia called Marspedia, and we have ongoing educational and outreach projects as well. And so we're always looking for support from the general public. Uh, you could buy a membership in the Mars Society. It's uh, $50 a year, $25 for students and seniors. That helps directly support us. And we also have uh, our conference every year um, that is online and, and also in person. Now, we went and had it at Arizona State last October, and we're going to have it uh, somewhere again this year. So uh, that's another way people can get involved. All right, super. Well, thanks so much, James. It was fabulous talking with you. Likewise, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and that was James Burke, Executive Director of the Mars Society. Now, in the second half of the 20th century, advancements in technology as well as the space race between the Soviet Union and the United States fueled public interest in Mars. The Viking missions in the 1970s marked the first time humans successfully landed a spacecraft on the red planet, and these missions generated a wealth of data about the Martian surface and atmosphere over several years of operation. Building on these missions, together with explorations of the Pathfinder rover, Spirit and Opportunity, Curiosity, and robotic explorers from Europe, China, India, and the UAE are opening doors to the Martian cities of the future. Also, if I am being honest, there are advantages to having a planet of robots. It works for the Cylons, 
didn't it? Uh, one of the great challenges of bringing humans to Mars is the time needed to get there and back. A journey from Earth to Mars using chemical rockets would take about seven months. A new generation of nuclear thermal propulsion systems could reduce that time to around eight weeks. That's uh, like going from the gestation period of a porcupine to that of a kangaroo. Think about it. <laughs> Our species now has a chance to start fresh, building a wide range of new societies based on modern values and beliefs. Far too many societies on Earth are still constrained by the morals and values of historical figures who did not live recently enough to have ever heard of a dinosaur or know that meteorites fall from space. It's your Uncle Ben here. No. Not the rice guy. Franklin. That's right. The stove guy. Kites, lightning rods, all that. Honestly, I probably would have loved dinosaurs. Did you know that I did some of the earliest work studying layers of oil just one molecule thick? That helped lead to the discovery of the lipid by layer model of the biological membrane. Knowledge is power, good day. On Mars, we can create small network communities prioritizing sustainability, equality, and progress. And while the existence of numerous small settlements is likely to result in a wide range of communities based on various principles, these groups will also be largely dependent upon each other for survival, connecting and unifying people across the Red Planet. The human migration of Mars will serve as a catalyst for technological achievements. Uh, we'll have to solve complex challenges to thrive on a new planet, from creating self-sufficient habitats, to developing new forms of transportation across and over Mars. Firmus. So, that's like terra firma, but on Mars? Uh, yeah. That's clever. Hmm. Finally, establishing a large population of humans on the surface of Mars offers our species our only real hope of survival in the face of planet-wide disaster. If the po population of Earth were to be wiped out by a wayward asteroid, an unstable despot with visions of bringing about the end of days, or climatic disaster, our species would continue to survive on the ruddy surface of Mars. Moving out into the cosmos offers humanity our only real hope of immortality. That's right, it's the old plug your show at the end of the video trick. If you enjoyed this episode of The Coffee Companion, please subscribe, comment, and share the episode with all of your favorite secret agents. Head on over and see every episode of at thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. VIP subscriptions are 25% off for educators with any .edu email address. Next week on The Cosmic Companion, we talk about making space sustainable with Daniel Bach from Morpheus Space. Be sure to join us starting on the 11th of February. Martian showtimes will be delayed by 7 minutes 36 seconds because, you know, the speed of light. It's all relative, you know. It feels amazing who we get on this show sometimes. Clear skies. <laughs>